Welcome to July, summer. It's the Homeworkers Tour. We're right at the end of the month, we 30th of June actually, that we're filming. So officially you could say it's the June tour. It's showing what's happened in June and fantastic growth. Like we're in the greenhouse here, so it's that much faster and stronger and melons which love warmth. You can, I've actually not seen them so good, but it's, it's this, <laughs> it's no big wins. It's, such an easy method for growing plants, as you're going to see right the way through the video. And tomatoes, they're doing okay. <laughs> the ones at the end, cherry tomatoes are cropping already, but always come sooner. That's Gardener's Delight there. The beef tomatoes come later, so it's good to have a range. And some varieties are good and some are not so good. I always try a few just to see. Here we even have a watermelon. We're going to see more of these melons and watermelons in the polytunnel as well. You'll see the contrasting growth there. And this I want to show you because it's about succession planting. And this is something that's good to do all summer long. Keep sowing. Uh, you can use my sowing timeline on the website, for example, just to find the best times to sow all these seeds. So I'll give you an example of what's just coming up now, there's golden beetroot, uh, different types of beetroot basically that you can still sow, but as soon as possible now, first week of July, I'd say in, in a, we're a zone eight maritime temperate climate. Uh, there's endive chicory. These are all endive and chicory, which are ready to go out quite soon. And these will be another couple of weeks before we actually put them in the ground. There's purple sprouting broccoli, savoy cabbage. These were pricked out from a seed tray. And kale, all of those you can still sow and that way you can keep your gaps full in the garden. And I can show you that a bit in the small garden, <laughs> where we have, like this was winter cauliflower, which finished. We planted leeks. These are just about to finish. There's savoy cabbage, cauliflower, and I'm gonna plant lettuce there. The peas, we've got one more pick. They've been fantastic. We've had about four kilos of beautiful peas from here, and that will then be some winter brassicas. And here we have strawberries, which I hadn't dared to grow before because of badgers. <laughs> we've got a lot of badgers around here, and they, if they get in here, it makes such a mess. But anyway, I did try, and we just netted them against birds. And what you can do when your strawberries finish is cut them all, put that on the compost heap and then just spread some compost for the year. It, it doesn't matter if it goes in, falls on the plants a bit like that. You know, it literally doesn't matter. I'm, I'm gonna put on here about one inch. This actually is some cow manure, which I bought and I wasn't expecting it to look like this. <laughs> That's cow manure with lots of bits of wood uh, because the farmer bedded his cows with some wood and it's, Proving good, as we'll see in a minute. So yeah, just keep planting and you can then enjoy the benefits. Like from spring planters, we got these amazing purple cauliflower. They were ravaged by aphids. It's been a really difficult spring and early summer for high aphid population, gray aphids in that case. And we've had white fly, black, black fly on the beans. But just lately, this explosion of ladybirds. So, Sometimes you just have to wait, and we, I use water mainly against the aphids. I'm also doing a lot of seed saving. So these are peas, it's a variety called Delicate, which I have not picked at all. And there you can see a pea pretty much at the stage where it's ready to be picked for seed. There's no harm in leaving it. And unless it's raining every day, these will dry on the plant for another two weeks probably, and then we'll pick them all. And that's, peas are easy because you just need one plant. Whereas these plants, you need like carrots, 10, <laughs> I'm using. I'm not sure it's enough actually. I'm no expert on seed saving, but I'm just showing you what I'm doing here, just having a go. Uh, so what I did was I selected my best carrots from last December's harvest and actually then transplanted them here. They're just such beautiful plants. <laughs> if you, even if you didn't get any seed, it's a lovely ornamental one. And they're for harvest sometime in late August probably. Same story for the beetroot. Ah, oh, there's a ladybird. Yeah, there's just loads. And there's not many beetroot plants there, but just enough hopefully to get some cross-pollination from a bigger gene pool. 
And I wonder how many of you will recognise this one, which is parsnip, in fact. These have been very striking. So seed saving is great just for the flowers. <laughs> but again, we selected the best parsnips, like 10 best parsnips, and actually planted them. That way, aiming to get good um, genes in your seeds, which doesn't apply to lettuce. Uh, well, you can select a nice lettuce for sure, but you only need one. You don't need cross-pollination for lettuce. So like we've got uh, Lola Rossa. They're very beautiful, the way they just go up to a point. And that's little flower buds forming, which will become seeds by the end of August, September even. And that's a red cos, gorgeous red cos, which again will rise up. May well need a little stake. Here we have a green cause, and this is a Batavian type called Saragossa, which is one of my favourites actually, the crops are a long time. And this I'm definitely going to stake actually, because as the taller they get, the more likely they are to blow over in the wind. <clears throat> and then another beautiful feature of the early summer garden is the first flowers coming out. I love these zinnias. So this is a variety called Elegans. And French beans just starting to, well, they're not cropping yet, but they won't be long. So tiny little beans there. And the timing of these works nicely because we finished the broad beans and peas. The one more week of picking probably we have. And then the French beans take over. So we have a succession of beans to eat. And another succession lettuce. So we're planting lettuce this is main second planting. The first planting is still picking and but finishing in a couple of weeks. So these take over for leaf lettuce. Onions is going to be another two or three weeks. They're starting to swell nicely. Most of them are still standing up. I wait until maybe half, a quarter, a third to half roughly are falling over before thinking of pulling them. So there's no rush on them. And this has been a great joy because dahlia, these tubers, this is a three-year-old plant and it was, they were in the ground all winter. We had a 10 day period of frost in December, it went down to minus nine. Wow, look at that. <coughs> so I didn't think they'd come back. We actually sowed some more. So these have all survived. Uh, these are seven years old actually. And likewise this one, particularly nice red one whose name I don't remember. That, because I was, wasn't sure it was going to reappear, I planted some zinnias around it. So we got zinnias and daily there. I just love the reds at this time of year. They, or through summer, they just feel so summery. Our climate can be quite cloudy like today. We don't, it's not guaranteed sunshine. So the bright reds really add that color. And different colored cauliflowers too. There's another one that, that's green cauliflower from real seeds. And more beans. So these these are what in England we call runner beans, uh, pole beans, and they make uh, pods that a lot of people eat. I, actually, I prefer them for the seeds. So that's what these are for. And it's a white seeded runner bean. Basically, we wait until the pods go yellow and even brown on the plant, then pick them, shell them out, make sure they're really dry before putting them in a jar. And the next one's here. You can see the difference with the purple flowers. That's Borlotti beans. So these are harvests from last autumn, early autumn, very first week of October. With the Borlottis, we just wait until the whole plant is almost dead. The leaves start to go brown and fall off. And then uh, you can see the pods very easily, pick them, bring them in somewhere dry, get them really dry, crisp, walk on them. And that breaks open the pods and you can do a bit of winnowing to get the seeds. Here's an example of how we do the lettuce. So this is just had a first pick some cos and that should crop then for another eight weeks roughly. And here we have the first sunflower, literally. That's pretty good for 30th of June in our climate. And you can see it's a multi-heading uh, orange variety. It's one I saved seed from myself, so I'm not entirely sure the name of it. Lost in the records. Mm. 
We've been making a lot of compost recently with all the hedge prunings that we'll see shortly. And that's why the temperature is quite high. It's actually almost higher than I'd like, 70 centigrade. And th this heap about a week ago was sort of, no, it was about there actually. And we just added a lot on top. And when you do that, in fact, the heat can go down as well as up. So the whole heap is now cooking. <laughs> and I put this cover on yesterday. So it's a bit of cardboard and plastic just to finish off, keep the rain off. Uh, we'll turn it in about six weeks time. And here you can see the current heap. So we just started this one and put cardboard is only around the edge just to stop the bindweed growing in. And here actually is just an example of finished um, compost from doing this. So that's about eight months old. Uh, we did just put up a video about making uh, compost actually, if you want to have a look. But this method works really well in lining the sides with cardboard, keeping the warmth and moisture in. This bush, the um, sunberry, it's got a bit dry. I uh, wasn't paying enough attention. We've had, we've had a lot of dry weather. Uh, in the last eight weeks, we've had about 40 millimeters of rain. That's, uh, well, even less actually, about an inch and a half. Uh, we've been watering a lot. We water by hand, uh, just very selectively. So some plants do go a bit dry, but with no dig, the roots go down nicely. Like for example, these shallots, which we harvested 10 days ago, they've, we never watered them at all. So they, they're easy to grow. They plant in October and you could just take a, a bulb like that. That will be your shallot that you put in the ground in October. So you've got your seed as well as your harvest. That's a variety called Longo. And this one is Echelot Grise, much smaller reputed to have the best flavor of any shallot. I don't know, I think it's, uh, by the time they're cooked up, unless you get a dish of pure shallot, you might not notice that, but they're, they're tasty, as are the garlic. So again, roughly a week ago, 10 days ago, these were harvested. Uh, they're, they're white when they come out of the ground and then you see how they go kind of pink. <laughs> they're really pretty color. Uh, this is hardneck, so they're, they're firm and didn't get so big because hard net mature later, which means they don't grow quite so much before the rust arrives. And we had a lot of rust on the garlic this year, but even so, this is all outdoor grown soft necks here, which had quite a bit of rust during the last month. And in spite of that, they're doing all right. The rust, for any of you who haven't seen it, is it's dry now, so it doesn't show up so much, but there's all those little spots. They were bright orange at first, and then they, they take the energy out of the leaf and it goes yellow and it can't photosynthesize anymore. But generally speaking, if you can get your garlic in early, like October, and really get your soil in good heart, no dig wins again, uh, compost on top, good drainage over the winter, automatic, thanks to adding compost. So, you know, it's just an easy method. Like here, if you look at the last tour, which was around five weeks ago, uh, you can see you, what you would see in that one, just those few weeks ago is mostly black plastic. Because what we did was we put compost and plastic on top of weedy grass. So it was like what you see behind in January when we put this down, you can still see the black plastic there. Now, I'm not a great advocate of plastic. This, I'm not saying you should use this all the time. This was just a one-off starting out phase when you've got a lot of weeds. If you took on an allotment, say, that was just thick with weeds, this is a really easy way to exclude light from those weeds and kill them. And then while they're dying, you can grow something like this. So these are Crown Prince and Ochiki Curry squash. Plants went in on the 19th of May, six weeks ago. Ah, it's like, wow. <laughs> And we haven't watered. Yeah, you know, so that's one, another advantage of the plastic. It holds in the moisture, which is there at the time. We actually had 20 millimeters of rain uh, last week, and that's just under an inch. So that, most of that will have gone into the holes in the plastic because it's old, it's four years old. Uh, we'll use it again and again. And that means it takes in a bit of rain, but smothers most of the weeds 
it's, it's a bit of a win-win, I feel. Uh, we'll roll it up in September after the squash harvest. Uh, here we have some new plantings. So there's beetroot that went in after the garlic. So that's just over a week ago, multi-zone beetroot. And squash that we're, sorry, chard that we're picking for salad. So that's the small plants and some we've let grow a bit and that, that's for picking to cook. Oh, and actually, <laughs> I just noticed this might cheer some of you up, uh, plague with pests. That damage, that's um, deer. Adam came up, was up here yesterday morning quite early and he said there was a deer happily grazing away. I can put up with that if it's just like one deer nibbling the edge. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll put bird netting on like we've done here for the new carrots coming up between the lettuce. So the lettuce in this bed we've picked for nine weeks. So we just did the ninth pick uh, two days ago. No, yesterday, yesterday morning. And the carrots were sown two weeks ago. So they're coming up between and rabbits love the carrots. We're gonna see what they do in a minute. Uh, but I wanna show you first the potatoes here. Just because there's something really interesting of comparison. You can see how this plant here is just looking a little bit weak. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why. It might be lack of moisture, actually. We haven't watered these much, and I think really that's what they're suffering from. Um, I put these here, though, just to mention, like, believe it or not, these potatoes were harvested nearly a year ago, and it's the same variety, Charlotte, and that one is feeling really firm to me. And if, if you don't take off the sprouts in the sack, so it's in a dark sack, that's what it looks like, and just so you know, these are totally fine to eat. Some people say you shouldn't eat them if they're sprouting, but we've been eating them until now. So we had, we've had potatoes all the time. And then with no dig, you, you just pull like this and see what's there. And because it's, the, the soil hasn't been disturbed, the tubers don't go so deep. That's the remains of the seed potato, all squishy. And the new tubers yeah, I mean, it's not as many as we normally get, but you can see it's a nice harvest and very simple. You're not, oh yeah, there's another one actually. In fact, every variety is different. If you're one, looking at this and wondering, well, mine don't look like that. See, that's one that would have grown some more if the leaves had been good and if, if there was enough moisture. I think it's moisture shortage as much as anything. You can see how dry this compost is on top. So we just put some compost on top of the plant to stop them going green and want that one a little bit you could just cut that bit of green off it's not a lost potato and in terms of keeping seed I'd look to you know, we'll store them all in sacks but keep one like that uh, take with that out of the sack in January put it somewhere light it'll sprout you can plant it next spring this rye has grown hugely again if you look at the maybe tour you'll see it's probably sort of here now it's up here uh, but more than anything the, the ears are starting to ripen so it could harvest within a month it may or may not be still here when we come back depends on the weather uh, but again you see with the uh, ground how much it's cracking around the edge just showing how dry it is and although we had the rain it's yeah <laughs> still pretty dry it's good for seed saving though, so the broad beans here around the asparagus are for seed. If you want to do this, you've got to grow just one variety. They would cross pollinate otherwise with other varieties. And there is the amazing result of rabbit eating beetroot. They almost like sculpture. I actually really appreciate how thorough they are. They'll eat one beetroot to almost nothing uh, before they move on to the next one. In fact, there's one up here, which is just, that, that, oh yeah, there it is. I mean, look at this. So all the leaves on the ground and there's the remains of the beetroot. There's just a tiny bit with its roots in the ground. And ah, uh, I can put up with that. We, we're still harvesting a lot of beetroot from here, but new plantings, like I do not want to lose my carrots. That's winter carrots. So that's, we're finding the bird netting is enough at the moment anyway to keep the rabbits off but they they live up in that corner and we often see them up there they eat a lot of grass and 
yeah, they just come down sometimes when they feel like it to the vegetables. Like they haven't eaten these carrot leaves, maybe they're just too high. The reason for making this high bed actually was to keep the carrot root fly off, which are supposed to like ground level mostly. Uh, it's certainly been good for the carrots, so sort of selective pulling of the larger carrots. You can see some very nice ones. What we made this bed from was the bottom half was soil and the top half is green waste compost. So that's the, probably the cheapest one to buy. Uh, it's not hugely nutritious, but it's certainly good enough for nice carrots, as you can see. And in fact, if you look here, that's what it looks like. It's that black stuff over there. Uh, just delivered by a two-ton lorry and that's mushroom compost here you can see the bindweed <laughs> it's endemic here and it's even growing right out through the compost and what we did was just to check the nutrition of the heap of the compost that's paris second early potatoes planted on the edge to compare with these ones which is also paris second early potatoes planted at the same time in some of that cow manure that I showed you earlier, which is bedded on wood. And you can see it's looking pretty good. It's clearly nutritious. So that comes from a local supplier, Woodland Horticulture, if any of you are in the, this region. We're looking now a bit at the edge and Charlie has been cutting it this morning. I want to show you the device we use for that, but first we're also going to have a look at a potato harvest. And a different variety. So this is Linza Delicatess and that's a pretty good sign that a potato's not actually growing much more. The way the leaves are going yellow quite a bit, they're not diseased, it's just old age senescence. Uh, that one, by the way, got squashed by the, <laughs> the Achillea falling on top. But again, I'll just pull it to show you the difference. And these are not superb because we're a bit close to the hedge, which has taken a lot of moisture. Actually, that's feeling quite nice. And you can just see the difference with the charlotte. You've got, and that's why they call the salad, po salad potato, you've got a lot more small ones. But yeah, again, there's the seed, the original seed. And so, it's very simple with no dig um, harvesting potatoes and this is not not the biggest yield but actually it's not bad I mean, for the amount of work to to grow them which is pretty much nothing once you've got your bed there i would recommend this for any any beginner like why not just plant a potato preferably in the spring say two or three weeks before the, uh, the last frost so just as it's starting to warm up and you could be doing that this time of year through July mainly. Second earlies like that are brilliant because then you've got time to plant something else. You harvest in July, you could plant leeks, broccoli, beetroot, whatever. <laughs> this is the new range of shirts, what new slogans that we've developed for a bit of fun. And they're available on T-Mill website. There might be a link at the bottom of this video as well. It's organic cotton. High quality shirt. <laughs> yeah, this is what I want to show you. So it's a really good tool. And you can use it for cutting high. Uh, we're chopping back the elder a bit. Just because along here partly to keep light on the polytunnel. Uh, but yeah, Charlie did all that in about an hour and a half. Uh, both the ground level the nettles were starting to come right over the path and falling on top and before they seed. And then all of this, we, we'll just rake it into a line and run the lawnmower over the top. And that provides a huge amount of food for the compost heap, which means more vegetables and happier soil and plants. This bottom door we made, and so I leave it in most of the time means I don't need to open and shut the main doors, keeps the rabbits out. And 
it's in here it's actually with the lack of sunshine it's not much warmer than outside and last night in here it went down to nine degrees centigrade that's 48 fahrenheit just so you know you know it's like these are not hot houses but if the sun comes out then it really does warm up and keep the wind off and yeah as a result we had a watermelon in fact this is a variety i've not grown before <clears throat> where it was hanging there yesterday and yesterday evening i noticed it had fallen off it's a variety called little darling so the idea is it's small watermelon that's why i was surprised how big this one got and i'm just going to cut it because i want to see if it fell off because it's ripe i've not grown hanging watermelons before and it feels juicy oh i don't know the seeds look um white more than brown there's only one way to find out though if it's a little bit sweet oh bother <laughs> it's yeah i would say it's edible but it's not really fully right <coughs> so uh yeah that, that's where it fell off from I just don't know. Uh, what I'm hoping will happen now is that there's more babies up here. If quite a few might develop at the same time, it could be then that the we'll get lots of medium-sized ones which will hang there better. There's a, it's the only way to find out if something works is to try it, but you know, I was recommended it. Um, the rest of these watermelons are just going on. That, that's one there, another one, and that's a variety called Early Moonbeam which normally I do go on the ground and you can see how it, that's one plant has gone all over there. Very extensive. Um, you need quite a bit of space for a watermelon plant. Uh, there's another loofah like we saw in the greenhouse. So as long as they don't get red spider mite, which can be a problem, then that will ripen sometime actually as late as late September. While the cucumber plants are cropping all the time. I pick and sell them when they're quite big. So even tiny bit bigger than that and I'm taking off the second cucumber each time roughly the second so I'm not letting if you didn't do that you'd have a cucumber on every node there'd be one there as well as being there and there'd be one there as well as being there and that would mean there would be like five cucumbers all close together and that takes so much energy out of the plant that it kind of exhausts itself temporarily and then you get none further up and then you get the next lot so you get feast followed by famine so taking out every second one just helps spread the harvest over a longer period. Whereas with melons, you don't need to do that in my experience. But what I do is I don't let them develop until they get to about thigh height, even waist height. Because the actual melon, unlike cucumber, it develops on the side shoot. And then there's your melon. And actually, if you let the side shoot develop a side shoot, you get another one. But that one I don't want because it's enough energy from the plant again you know, there's only so much fruit that any one plant can grow with the amount of leaves it has so just leaving lots of fruit doesn't mean necessarily you're going to get loads of harvest uh, you have to match it a bit and similar with tomatoes although also with tomatoes it depends a bit on the variety and here's one that's not a great variety i hadn't tried it before i thought i'd have a go for a bit of fun the black tomato um, it's also got really bad leaf roll and that, that is from, um, I think, I believe from what I'm told, and it kind of bears out, it's from night and day temperatures being too different. So cold nights, hot days. Because on my outdoor tomatoes, I never see the leaf roll. It's not so hot by day, basically. So it's a bit hot in here, uh, which I don't mind for other things. And then um, oh, here's another one as well, a bit the same. What I want to show you here also is how we twist these around the string. So this one is just about due for it where I'm going to go around like that. I'll take that leaf and just do it something like that each time. Don't try and get the last bit. It's just guiding it to keep it more or less upright. The string is just buried under the root ball of the plant. It's a very quick and simple system. And then I'm taking off the lower leaves. Um, not too many, but I mean, just to give you an example, I could do one there. You know, there's no kind of hard and fast rule about this. Some people take off more leaves than that. That, believe it or not, though, is, is an older leaf and it's not doing a huge amount of photosynthesizing work for the plant. 
compared to the newer leaves. It's the same, same pattern for pretty much all plant growth. It's why we can take the larger leaves off the lettuce and they still grow because you've left the little baby ones. I mean, look at these moments here. It's just incredible. That's a variety called Emia. This is 30th of June. You know, they've been in the ground for seven weeks. How do they do that? It's just phenomenal. So the, the mulching here is, is not massive, but it's mushroom compost on top of horse manure. And the horse manure actually is from the hotbed. Then. That's the original soil level there, where you can see all those lovely melon roots. So you can see how plants root a lot near the surface. This is, relates to no dig again. You know, you're, you're favoring the rooting zone near the top where there's a lot of air, a lot of microbes. Uh, you get a lot of nutrition. And that was probably about four centimetre, maybe an inch and a half of mulch. That's for the whole year. That will, we're not going to put any more until next spring. So this will take, provide food for all the winter salads as well. Food conjunction with the soil organisms making it available in the soil. But I'm not feeding these plants at all. So that's for me, that's a big time saver. And coming up, we've got some videos related to that. Like um, on Monday, actually, I'm doing a, a video interview with a guy called Dr. Eric Berg, who's a nutritionist. And we're going to talk about soil and microbes. He, he was knowledge of nutrition. He also does keto diet, actually, which I'm not particularly in favour of. But I just want to find out more about it. You know, I'll try anything or find out anything, and I'm very happy to share that information with you. And likewise, we're doing a couple of culinary videos on Sunday. So that's in two days' time. We've got Chantel Nicholson here, who's a Michelin Green Star a chef from London, Mayfair. Runs a restaurant called Apricity, and she'll be here cooking up a few vegetables from the garden with Edward filming and on Tuesday Gaz Oakley's coming and Gaz is a wonderful vegan chef from Wales who's also really into gardening so he's seeing the lovely uh, interchange between growing and eating and he's going to do some demo here of that so those are videos which will be coming up later on on my channel do subscribe